um, the topics and uh, uh, some things that uh, um, will be very useful for um, for your project um, that um, you do for uh, uh, your lab part. So uh, it's mostly some uh, diagnostic diagnostics for the uh, for the tropics, the interseasonal variability of the tropics. So um, the outline uh, of my talk includes the uh, Madden Julian oscillation, a brief uh, overview, and some uh, MJO diagnosis diagnostics or MJO diagnosis, and um, the boreal summer interseasonal oscillation. Uh, which is another component of the intraseasonal variability of the tropics. And then uh, for this part, the intraseasonal variability of the mid latitudes, I will present some of the uh, very new results uh, from um, my current work and then some um, conclusions. So the when we look at the tropics, um, we can um, categorize the major modes of uh, tropical precipitation variability, uh, for example, as um, consisting of this um, annual cycle. Then we have the ENSO cycle. Then we have the um, intraseasonal oscillations. And then um, the cloud uh, clusters and um, here these uh, arrows try to um, give us an idea on uh, the interactions between um, these um, components of the um, tropical variability. Um, I I took this uh, diagram from a paper by Rasmussen and uh, and Arkin. So. Uh, what I'm going to uh, focus today will be this um, circle here with the uh, intraseasonal uh, oscillations. And um, as uh, we heard um, in the um, previous talks, they can um, modify um, the annual cycle, but they are also um, controlled through the uh, by the um, the outer circles, the annual cycle and and the uh, and so cycle. So this is something that uh, we want to uh, keep in mind, and this uh, is the reason that uh, we all we said that uh, the interactions between the, the tropics and the mid latitudes are influenced by uh, by the mean state because. Um, as we can see, uh, there are ad other outer circles that uh, play a role in, um, in this uh, variability. So now let's take a look at the um, variability in this window, the intraseasonal window, which is defined as uh, 20 to 100 uh, day um, variability. And here I am showing on the left the variance um, uh, as the ratio between uh, the, the color, the shading here, uh, represents the uh, ratio between the variability in this uh, 2100 day uh, window and the um, total variability. For the uh, wind, um, the top left, uh, OLR top bottom and the left um, column corresponds to the winter boreal winter it's an extended boreal winter defined between uh, November and April and then uh, the right uh, column corresponds to the boreal summer <laughs> again an extended boreal summer that covers uh, March uh, October so we see that um, a large a fraction of the total variability of the tropics, because we are looking between um, 30 south and 30 north, um, up to 50% uh, uh, is explained by this variability, uh, by the uh, intraseasonal uh, variability. And uh, it's much 
stronger in the winds than uh, in the, uh, the anomalies. Uh, another thing to notice is the uh, location, the regions where uh, this variability um, dominates. For example, we see some um, seasonal uh, variability. Uh, seasonal, yeah, seasonal variability when when we compare the um, the two seasons, and um, in both fields, in the uh, wind and also in in the precipitation, and of course in the um, in the boreal summer, we recognize the largest uh, variability um, in the Indian Ocean, which. Uh, we know is associated with the uh, summer Indian monsoon, and um, we do we see um, in the uh, precipitation the um, intraseasonal variability um, that we know it's associated with uh, with the MJO. So what we have in this um, so. This is the, uh, the total variability, but can we uh, go further and parse this variability uh, in, um, as, uh, in certain um, band frequencies or, uh, or uh, wavelengths? And we have seen this diagram um, many times during the talks um, during this, uh, this week. It's the wheeler kiladis diagram or the wave number frequency spectra. And uh, since um, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with how these diagrams uh, are computed, I decided to uh, throw here um, just um, a little bit of information. And the way that we calculate these diagrams, we, um, the, the diagrams are based on the uh, OLR. So we, at each grid point, we divide the OLR into a a symmetric component and an a so-called asymmetric component. And what we mean by a symmetric component uh, is defined as the uh, uh, average between the uh, OLR at that particular latitude and the OLR um, in the uh, other hemisphere. And then uh, the um, anti-symmetric component it's defined as the uh, OLR at that particular latitude from which we subtract the OLR at the um, equivalent uh, latitude in, in the southern uh, hemisphere. So if we add these two, uh, we actually get the, the total field. Right? And after we do this, we um, do a frequency zonal wave uh, number uh, and, uh, power spectrum. And what we see here in, in these two um, diagram is actually uh, that component of the power spectrum that's, abo that's um, um, above the, um, um, the uh, power spectrum of, of uh, the basic state. Right? So uh, it's the ratio between um, the actual power spectrum and the spectrum of, of the basic state, right? Because we are interested in what, um, not in the power spectrum of the uh, mean state, but what uh, the noise, basically. Well, the variability that stands above the, the, the mean state. Right, so that's how we, uh, we end up with, uh, with these diagrams and uh, on the horizontal line, we have the zonal wave number, and on the vertical, we have the frequency. So now if we look at um, frequencies uh, between the um, 200 and uh, 20 and 100 days are the frequencies that actually um, they start here. We have the 30 days and um, go down. So this is the, the region uh, of interest for... Uh, for our uh, intraseasonal variability um, study. And um, as we can see here, we have this big blob that um, you was shown uh, in the previous day that corresponds to the Madden-Julian oscillation. 
we don't have too much um, into the um, anti-symmetric uh, anti um, component. And um, in the uh, westward uh, portion of the spectrum, uh, we have the, uh, a little bit of the power associated with the uh, equatorial Rossby uh, waves. So now let's um, talk about the, uh, the MJO. This spectrum is, uh, uh, this, both of them, but, uh, these spectra are computed using the whole uh, year. So we don't um, compute this uh, power spectrum um, by um, applying them to, um, to a season. You can do that. Uh, I don't. I don't have that uh, that figure here. But let's start talking about uh, just a little bit about the MJO. And I don't know how many of you know that um, Roland Madden and Paul um, Paul Julian. I have them in in this figure. This is Roland Madden and and Paul Julian. And if you think this is the only oscillation that you can shake hands with <laughs> with, with Mr. Um, um, Madden and, and Mr. Julian, none of the other oscillations are associated with, uh, uh, with the person. And um, currently, uh, they are both, uh, both retired. So just a, a very uh, quick uh, overview, what, what is the, uh, the MJO? And this um, diagram was actually uh, published by Madden and Julian in um, 72, where described uh, what, uh, what is the, uh, the MJO. And at that time, they had observations at two um, stations. And this, um, so one, uh, this uh, diagram was based just uh, using uh, observations at two, uh, two stations. And the observations were uh, surface pressure, winds, and, uh, and precipitation. So a few um, um, landmarks on, uh, on this uh, diagram. Um, here we have uh, Africa, um, Indonesia, and uh, um, South America. The uh, regions with the uh, um, highlighted with red uh, represent regions with uh, negative pressure anomaly, and uh, regions uh, highlighted with blue represent uh, regions with uh, positive uh, pressure anomalies. Here we have the um, date line, and uh, the green arrows just um, give us the, the local circulation. So um, they describe. Um, the MJO at that time was not MJO; it was just an, an oscillation in which convection builds up in the first in the uh, Indian uh, Ocean, uh, where we can see um, this uh, region with uh, uh, low pressure, and the uh, convection it's uh, slightly to the uh, east of this region of um, low pressure, and then. Um, the circulation associated uh, with this buildup of uh, convection, uh, we have uh, uh, two, um, two cells. Um, the, on the um, west of the convective activity, uh, we have a cell uh, circulation with uh, westerlies at the surface and uh, easterlies above. And to the east of the convection, the, we have a cell with the reverse circulation with easterlies at the surface and uh, westerlies uh, above. So about four days later, the um, convection uh, intensifies. The um, region with a low pressure system um, extends and the region with high pressure system um, disappear. And uh, as a result, uh, the um, the cell located to the uh, east of the convection expands all the way to, um, to the dead line. Then, um, again, four days um, later, the convection um, moves um, eastward. And then the, uh, both cells 
uh, expand and the, um, they notice that the circulation to the west uh, has a stronger uh, upper tropospheric uh, uh, westerlies. Then, um, again, four days later, the low pressure uh, anomaly in the Indian Ocean propagates uh, very rapidly uh, eastward um, with the, therefore the circulation um, extends farther um, eastward and there is a, a slight um, displacement of, uh, of uh, convection. Another thing that happens around uh, this day is that the, the circulations uh, to the east and west of the convection, they uh, become um, um, symmetric. Uh, four days later, the convection has uh, moved. Now it's in the uh, western uh, Pacific, and the region of uh, high um, pressure starts to uh, build up to the, uh, the west of uh, convective uh, activity. Uh, 20 days uh, later, the convection is in the Central Pacific, and um, at this, uh, this point, we still have this pattern of um, convection with, and the circulation, but the circulation becomes um, decoupled uh, from, from the convection. By um, uh, day uh, 24, the convection um, dissipates, and then finally, about, about uh, day 28, the um, uh, high pressure um, area with uh, high pressure, uh, that it was the uh, station where they had uh, measurement. They had uh, measurement of the so, uh, Canton station and uh, Nairobi station in, uh, in Africa. So, the, the high pressure system uh, starts to build up and the cycle um, repeats. And this um, diagram that they publish in 72, it's still valid. This is still our understanding of the Madden Julian oscillation and nothing has, uh, has changed regarding this, um, this diagram. So this diagram is very nice, but how do, what do we do to actually um, identify the MJO in, in observation if we take precipitation or pressure or winds or... So we have um, a few uh, methods available and uh, depending on what your goal is, you can choose uh, any of these. Um, so um, I already presented you the uh, willard kiladis diagram, so I'm not introducing it here, but with the willard kiladis diagram, it's very limited if, for example, you want to identify a particular event, you, you, you cannot say anything about that. So, um, the simplest method of identifying the Madden-Julian oscillation, which was actually used by Madden and Julian, it's a, um, just a temporal filtering of the OLR anomalies or the uh, or um, the winds, then we can look at the uh, space-time filtering. Um, we can do an EOF analysis of a single variable, or we can do a multivariate um, EOF analysis. And here are just a few uh, examples. When we do a time filtering of the uh, OLR anomalies, we end up uh, with a diagram, a uh, half-molar diagram in this uh, Diagram, the time um, starts at the top. So as we go down in time, we see these um, regions with the negative OLR anomalies, which uh, are, we can associate them with, with an MJO uh, event. So this uh, method has the advantages that uh, it captures the spatial and temporal scale of, of the oscillations. Um, but uh, what we, it's hard to identify uh, in this diagram is where the, an event starts and where, uh, where it ends. Um, it's very hard to say if this is an uh, independent event or there is some relationship between um, some 
um, some of the uh, events. And uh, in this diagram, we look only at the uh, OLR anomaly, whereas in that description that uh, I, I presented, um, we have a coupling between the, um, the, co the convection and the, um, the circulation. So the, uh, the other method that uh, we have available, it's uh, the um, EOF analysis using one variable. And here we have an example of the um, EOF analysis applied to the uh, OLR anomalies, uh, wind at um, 850 millibars anomalies and winds at um, 200 um, millibars. Anomalies. The anomalies uh, have to be uh, bandpass uh, filtered, which means first uh, we uh, remove the uh, annual cycle, the seasonal cycle, and then uh, we uh, bandpass filter the data to retain only the 20 and 100 day uh, variability. So here in this, we see the patterns uh, in the first three EOFs, one, two, uh, three, in the um, the three uh, variables, and and then we can look at the um, lack correlation um, between these uh, these variables. So, for example, here the lack correlation between the um, OLR and um, zonal wind at uh, A50 shows a um, lead lag relationship of about. Um, five, six um, days in uh, EOF1 and probably eight days in uh, EOF2. Um, this um, um, lead lag um, relationship between the, the variables um, changes a little bit when, for example, the uh, lead lag relationship between the OLR and uh, winds at um, 200 millibars is about uh, eight days. So again, um, this uh, method gives us, because it's, it's based on the uh, only one uh, variable, even though we look at, uh, at all of them, um, has some, some disadvantages. And for that reason, one of the most uh, used method is the multivariate EOF analysis, which uh, John mentioned yesterday that um, probably it's not the best one because tend to be dominated by by the winds. But what we do in uh, in this uh, method, uh, we take the filtered anomaly of OLR and winds at the low level and upper level. Uh, we normalize each variable by its standard uh, deviation, and then we do an AOF analysis of these variables average between 15 south and uh, 15 north. The first two combined uh, UF describe the propagation structure, structure of the MJO, and the first two PCs um, are used to calculate the uh, RMMM uh, index like uh, is shown here. And here is an example of how these uh, MJO UF patterns um, look like. So. This is the first first mode, and um, in this mode, um, this mode explains about 22% uh, of the variability. And then, if you look at the the variance explained by the uh, individual components, the OLR and the winds, you do see that the variance explained by the winds it is larger than the variance explained by uh, by the OLR, and uh, um, the arrows here uh, show the direction of the uh, winds at the um, surface and uh, upper level uh, for the, uh, the regions in the Indian Ocean and Western Pacific. And we can see that these um, patterns correspond to the uh, circulation cells that we saw in the uh, diagram uh, of um, Madden and, and Julian. Similar thing with the second mode. And now when we look the correlation, the, 
uh, between the, the two uh, UIFs, we see that the lead lag um, correlation is about um, 10 days. With the, since uh, now we can actually uh, look at the phases of, of the oscillation, which um, we are uh, uh, interested to um, evaluate, we can um, plot the, um, the two um, principal components, uh, PC, Two versus uh, PC1, and this will give us the uh, phases of, uh, of the oscillations with the uh, phase one um, in when the convection is located over the uh, Western Hemisphere, then we have the Indian Ocean, Maritime Continent, Western uh, Pacific, and so on. And here is an, uh, an example of um, you have, we have seen this, this diagram. Um, so um, um, the MJO is um, initiated in, uh, in this point here in sometimes in December. And then the amplitude grows and it moves um, eastward. And then uh, it switch, switch, uh, switches to the, uh, we are in uh, January. <coughs> It goes all the way around. It's uh, maintaining its strength, and then in February, it starts to decay, and it comes back um, in uh, in this circle, which represents the uh, weak uh, MJO. Um, one of the, uh, I mean, the advantages of, of this method is that we can identify the MJO. Uh, initiation, we can distinguish uh, between the events, is based on multiple variables. But uh, one of the um, disadvantages is that the wind dominates the signal, and therefore sometimes it can give uh, false um, MJO events. Okay, and um, here, uh, if we um, look at the, the phase uh, evolution of the um, precipitation here, and we are using the multivariate EOF analysis, we can actually match with the, um, the diagram of Madden and Julian. So um, I think here, um, phase one is, is done here, which corresponds to uh, this, um, panel F here, so uh, we have, and uh, the, the left panel corresponds to uh, November, March, which is uh, uh, boreal winter, and then uh, May, September, boreal um, summer. So this is actual the uh, precipitation, so positive values corresponds to um, active convection precipitation. So we do have uh, in the uh, Indian Ocean, uh, positive precipitation anomaly, and then this, uh, we, here we have phase two, the precipitation anomaly grows and uh, it moves uh, eastward. We see even though um, the MJO, uh, it is weaker uh, during the um, boreal summer, we do see um, a similar um, life cycle uh, during this, yeah. Sure. Yes. Well, if you look here, it's it's a little bit symmetric, and I and I think this is the strongest uh, uh, signal. So probably that component is dominated by the the strongest phase. I guess what I'm saying is the, spe the space time. Spectrum yeah, shows yeah. To be a little misleading in the sense that it's the oscillation is completely symmetric. Yes, the oscillation is not completely symmetric. That's true. But if you 
if you do look at the uh, asymmetric component, right, okay. there is something um, here, yeah. right? right? It's very weak and not well defined, right? I mean, if you if you look at this, the, you do a lit, you do see a little bit of uh, similarity, right? But um, it's I yeah, and and. Um, and another reason is that uh, this is based on the annu um, annual values, right? So if we look during the summer, convection is located mostly, I mean, is located north of the equator. So that space-time spectrum annually so uh, of Yes, there is a lot of details and a clobber uh, the fact that the Precipitation is located north and south of the equator for um, different seasons. Yes, I. <laughs> of course. Let, let me let, let me move. So with this, uh, if you don't, uh, anyone else has other questions about the MJO? Because I'm going to move to the summer, uh, boreal summer interested in isolation. No? OK. So in the boreal summer, things are um, a little bit more complicated than during the, um, the winter. And uh, we do have the, like you already have seen in, in the previous diagram, that we have interseasonal variability. And uh, for the summer, uh, the most common name is the boreal summer interseasonal oscillation. And it's, it's a, still a debate <laughs> um, about. Uh, this relationship between the uh, MJO and uh, the uh, north or propagation uh, intraseasonal oscillation. So during the summer, in addition to this uh, eastward propagation that uh, we uh, we already saw in in the previous um, diagram, there is a strong northward propagation, and uh, and people refer to this oscillation that propagates uh, northward as the northward propagation uh, intraseasonal oscillation. And various papers uh, find various uh, degrees of relationship between the uh, MJO and the northward propagation uh, ISO. And some people claim that 50% of these uh, NPISO are actually uh, related to MJO, other people go all the way to 85%. So uh, the jury, <laughs> it's it's still out for uh, for debate. Yeah, well, um, so for example, one explanation is that once, so you have eastward propagating um, convection during the summer, and then this uh, convection uh, is uh, dying out, and when it dies out, it generates these um, Rossby waves that uh, propagate uh, northwest, and that's what generates the uh, 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 north or propagation uh, ISOs, right? So the question is, it's an independent ISO or is related to this uh, east or propagation? So uh, we, we saw yesterday um, the talk uh, where uh, Hailin was talking about the mechanisms explaining the MJO. Well, for this uh, boreal summer intraseasonal oscillation, we have way more mechanisms proposed to explain the oscillations, and um, their the relative importance is still not um, sorted out. Right. So the uh, 
The North Core propagation oscillations have also two components. One is the uh, 36, it's a 30, 60 day component and uh, it's a pure northward propagation uh, oscillation. And then there is another uh, oscillation uh, with the period, uh, it can be pure 30 days or somewhere between 10 and 30 days that uh, propagates uh, north, uh, westward. And to give you an example, of um, this uh, NPISO uh, events, here are three um, three examples. Uh, one is um, corresponds to uh, an event in 2008, and we see this robust uh, northward uh, propagation uh, from uh, from all the from the equator all the way to uh, 20 north. Um, here in this uh, example, we see events that propagate both northward and uh, southward. Um, so it's a mixture. And then uh, in this event, we, we see um, some oscillations that are initiated in the equatorial region, but just um, stay here and, and don't manage to, um, to propagate. So, uh, how we uh, identify these oscillations? Um, we have way more um, methods than uh, we have available for, for the MJO, but relatively, um, well, now it's not recent, five years ago, um, Lee et al. has actually shown that the same multivariate analysis that has been used for the MJO can be applied uh, for identifying the um, northward propagation um, oscillations. The only thing you, you have to do is to uh, you change the domain where you uh, apply the, um, the uh, EOF uh, analysis. And they found out that the first two UIFs describe the 30, 60 day uh, oscillations and the UIF three and four describe the 10 to 30 day um, oscillations. And here is an example from their paper. UIF, uh, another difference is that you, they actually don't recommend doing any filtering of the data, you just take, you remove the annual cycle and the, the seasonal cycle and, and do the UF analysis. So when you do this, you end up with, um, this is UF1 um, and UF2 of the uh, north or propagating um, component. And uh, if you look at the uh, lead lag um, relationship between the two PCs, um, you see a um, relationship between about um, 12, 12 days and they did filter the data after they, um, they did a similar uh, analysis where they filtered the data and the relationship um, seems to be uh, about the same. Then if these are the patterns of UIF3 and uh, UIF4 for that uh, northwest uh, propagating uh, component and um, the lead lag relationship it is much shorter about two um, three days yes oh you have to um, from the pattern you can say yes yeah So, and uh, with these ones, you can also do the um, uh, wheeler hand on diagrams and, and look at the uh, evolution of, uh, of these uh, oscillations. Okay, so any questions about the um, tropical variability? Because I'm going to move to the, uh, yes, Fred. What's your opinion? Is, is this NPISO, is it just a... Uh, 
expression of the NJO, and then you see kind of the tilted Rossby dire. Something is tilted and something moves. That's what we. The impression of non-rotation propagation. That's what we claim in uh, in our paper in 2014. <laughs> yes. But then uh, we looked at um, other mechanisms uh, in a, um, and it's, it's very hard to say which, which one um, dominates, right? So there are, um, see, the, uh, this um, Boreal summer interseasonal oscillation, it's, even, it's more complicated in the sense that um, it happens on um, a limited region. So you have northward propagation associated with the summer Indian monsoon with the, over the uh, Western Pacific. But you have other monsoons regions where you don't have intraseasonal oscillations, right? So um, I think uh, right now people are trying to show that there is some ISO associated with the uh, West African monsoon, and you can correct me if uh, I am wrong. <laughs> um, so, it, it, with the MJO, it's easy. You just apply the UF analysis to the from zero to, to sixty, right? Uh, with the monsoons, with the interseasonal oscillation, this boreal summer depends where you do your. Uh, analysis. Um, there are regions where, for example, the SST is important, regions where the SST is not so important. Uh, it, it's, it's more complicated and it, it's not a, a clear um, answer. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we remove the seasonal cycle when when we do this right. analysis. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so So I think the right answer is you need another workshop <laughs> on this topic. It, it's, it's a topic uh, on its own, very, very broad. So, uh, and you can bring the best experts. <laughs> I am not. So now I want to move on into this um, mid-latitude variability. And the results I'm going to show here uh, are a collaboration with the uh, uh, my colleagues and other um, collaborators from uh, NOAA um, CPC. So I was very interested, uh, and I'm not actually the first one who asked these questions. People have uh, looked before. If there is any intraseasonal variability or uh, in the, the mid latitudes, right? So um, to try to answer that question, I um, asked my, uh, my colleague, v, v. Krishnamurti, who is in, um, has used before this uh, um, data adaptive method, the multi-channel uh, singular spectrum um, analysis, to look at the variability of, of the mid-latitudes. And um, this method is a, a more sophisticated um, UIF analysis, and it was um, introduced. I don't know if it was introduced by Gill, but uh, Gill seems to be the one who promoted this method. And uh, actually, Andy has used this uh, this method also. So there there are a few studies based uh, based on this method, and you can actually download the code from. Um, UCLA, and there is a, a commercial company that actually sells um, the uh, the code for 
uh, for this uh, analysis. So I won't go into the details of uh, of the analysis. I am just I just want to present the um, the results. So when we apply this uh, MSSA to the 500 uh, hectopascal joule potential high daily anomalies, we um, extracted three oscillations. So when we did the power spectrum of, the, of these oscillations, we found that one oscillation with a period of 120 days, one with a period, um, this is a mean value of 45 days, and another one with a period of uh, 25 days. Um, so when you look at the um, standard deviation of each of these uh, oscillations, um, you see that uh, each of them um, um, explains about um, between um, 10, 12, um, 12 percent. So com uh, when you combine them, um, these oscillations um, explain about 30 percent of the uh, variability of um, daily variability of the mid latitudes. So, um, and I um, label them as the, uh, since the first one has a period of about 120 days, um, it's not an intra-seasonal oscillation, so I call it the mid-latitude seasonal oscillation. And then the next two, I call them the mid-latitude intra-seasonal oscillation one and mid-latitude intra-seasonal oscillation two. So how this, the patterns of I mean, the life cycle of, uh, of these uh, oscillations um, look like. So here I'm looking at the uh, mid-latitude uh, seasonal oscillation cycle, and I have only the uh, uh, first half of the cycle. The second half is um, similar, but with the uh, reverse signs. So in phase one, we see this um, negative um, geopotential height anomalies over uh, Iceland, and um, over the end, uh, we see this uh, positive um, geopotential height anomalies over the uh, North Atlantic um, region, uh, extends a little bit over um, Scandinavia, and um, uh, another uh, pattern of positive um, anomalies um, over the uh, over the Pacific. So, in phase two, which um, corresponds um, about um, thir uh, not thirty uh, 50, fifteen days um, later. Um, we see that this, um, the negative height anomaly uh, retreats um, poleward, and the um, this uh, this positive uh, anomaly almost um, encircles the um, the whole um, the whole globe. Um, phase um, three. The, uh, this uh, positive and, uh, and negative uh, anomalies looks like almost, you have two uh, vortex cores um, that um, circle around uh, each other. And then um, in phase four, this um, negative um, anomaly that um, was located here over uh, Iceland um, is um, disappeared and is um, replaced by this uh, this uh, positive anomaly is uh, moving uh, northward uh, compared to uh, phase three and um, this the positive anomaly that we have over the uh, North Pacific um, it's replaced by this uh, negative um, anomaly and. Um, so, well, this is what 
interested, yes. I look in the Atlantic sector. Yes. I, I have done analysis to see what's the relationship between uh, NAO and, and this oscillation. And there are similarities, but not, um, you cannot say that this is the NAO. I did. But not in all phases. So yes, there are phases when, when there is high correlation, but there are phases when the correlation is zero. I, I don't have here, but I will show you the, uh, the results. Yes, so I, 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 yeah, I talked to a lot of people. Some, some people said it looks like uh, Arctic oscillation. I did, I, I looked at the relationship between the Arctic oscillation and Arctic oscillation. Yeah, I know. Well, I know that there is a high correlation between the uh, the time series of NAO and AO. Um, I cannot find the same high correlation between the time series of this oscillation and, uh, and the NAO. And also the patterns phase by phase do not, do not correlate, right? So my initial reaction was that, well, this is some subseasonal variability of the NAO, right? But it, it, it's not. <laughs> Okay, so let's move to the next one. Um, the uh, mid latitude intraseasonal oscillation one. Um, and here again, I am showing this just the, uh, the half cycle. And uh, the first reaction was this is PNA. Well, it turns out that it's not PNA. So um, it, it looks more like the PNA over this, uh, this region, right? But you also, um, for example, looks like you have like uh, the, the opposite sign of PNA over, over this region. Well, like I said, like I mean, maybe, but it turns out it, it, it's not PNA. So, um, um, right. So, I'm not going. I'm not going to explain all of these uh, patterns. And then this is the 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 second um, intraseasonal oscillation that um, it looks like this. So. Um, Phase one has a strong um, positive um, center over the uh, Alaskan region um, and um, you know, part of um, Greenland here. And then this strong uh, negative um, center over um, Eurasia. And, and these um, centers, um, move, uh, move around. So to look at the, yeah. Well, they, yeah, I have not done, you know, uh, um, one by, this one is 25 days. Okay. I, I, I have not done that comparison. I, I will do that. Thanks. So here um, are some uh, propagation characteristics of, of these uh, oscillations. So the first one is the um, 120 days, the middle one, the uh, 45 days, and then the, the bottom one, the 25 days. And 
Here we average between 60 north and 70 north, although this is outside of our mid-latitude um, domain. And here we have an average between uh, 40 north and 50 north. And the idea here in, is to look at the um, horizontal propagation of, uh, of these oscillations. So, for example, um, we see... Um, and uh, on the um, vertical axis, it's the phase. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's just 0 to pi. But here, uh, this one represents 120 days, the middle one, 45 days, and the, the bottom one, it's the, the 25 days. Right. So we do see um, they have both. Uh, um, they have strong um, westward um, component, uh, pro westward propagating um, components, but also um, not so not so strong. I would say in uh, in, in the mid uh, mid latitude, this 120 day, but we do see um, some. Uh, propagation in the 45-day uh, oscillation and, and not so much. It's more of a um, standing oscillation on the 45 days. We also plotted here the... We averaged uh, in the zonal direction, so we look at, to be able to look at the um, meridional propagation um, characteristics, and uh, this is between 40 and 30 west, and this is between 100 and, and 90 west. So the 120-day oscillation sh shows a um, strong northward propagation uh, in this region, not um, so much uh, over this region. Um, the 45-day uh, oscillation um, shows some uh, southward uh, propagation over this region and some um, weak northward propagation uh, over this region. So they both show uh, eastward and, uh, I mean, zonal and meridional uh, uh, propagation. And I did have calculated uh, phase speed, but I don't have here, and I, I, can't, I don't want to be wrong. So we look at some uh, the you know the uh, dynamical consistency of uh, um, of various fields uh, based on on these oscillations. And here I'm just showing phase two, um, just one phase. I mean, if you get the dynamical consistency in one phase, you will get the same thing for uh, for the other phases. And uh, we have the uh, surface pressure and the uh, um, surface uh, temperature here, and here the, um, the horizontal wind at uh, 850 uh, hectopascals. So we do see that, uh, for example, if we have a, uh, in, in this region um, negative um, surface pressure um, anomaly, um, associated with uh, um, it's not exactly the um, the same location but uh, a warm um, surface temperature and um, for example if we look at the um, the winds um, we do some we do see some um, cyclonic and anticyclonic um, circulations and that you can uh, match them with the um, uh, yeah they are they are equivalent barotropic yeah Uh, 
Okay, so we still have to sort out a lot about these uh, oscillations, but the question um, we started to uh, look at is, do these uh, oscillations have any impact on the forecast scale at week 3-4? I mean, if, if they are real oscillations, um, you expect that they will help you with improving the, the forecast scale in, in this time scale. So we took the um, linear uh, regression model that uh, NCEP is using um, to issue the week 3-4 uh, outlook. And that uh, model consists, has uh, the RMMM indices for the MJO, the two-week uh, mean NINEO 3.5 for uh, uh, and so, and then a daily index for a linear long-term uh, trend. And this model predicts the two-meter temperature anomalies and precipitation anomalies. And to give you an idea on the scale of this model, here is the purple line. It's the, um, the statistical model that I am describing here. And then the other lines corresponds to the... Um, CFS, for example, the red line, ECMWF, the blue line. So you can see that this model has comparable skill with the dynamical models. This is the, the here is the Heidke uh, skill score for uh, two meter temperature week three, four. Week three, four. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we added uh, both in this, uh, the 45-day uh, index and the 120-day in, uh, index, but I only show you results with the 120-day uh, index. So um, this is a little bit, uh, it's a complicated figure. So what it shows here, it's the impact on the two-meter temperature for the week 3-4 uh, outlook. So each... A uh, grid box here represents the uh, area average of United States. How I'm doing in time? I think I have. Okay. <laughs> right. So, and here the uh, distinction uh, is made on um, all Enso phases, El Nino phases, neutral phases, and La Nina phases. And uh, the vertical axis has the MJO phases, one through eight, and then the last uh, row here corresponds to weak or no, uh, no uh, MJO um, phases. And then um, on the horizontal, we have the, uh, the month for which the forecast uh, was made from January to um, December. So what I am uh, showing here is the uh, height key um, skill score difference between the model with um, four predictors, the one that has the 120-day oscillation, and the model uh, with three predictors that doesn't have the 120-day oscillation. So uh, Warm colors means an improvement in the uh, forecast skill. Um, and uh, we see a lot of um, blue colors here, especially for the, the winter, uh, I'm sorry, warm colors, especially for the, um, the winter months, um, not so much for, uh, for the summer. And this uh, plot here shows the statistical significance uh, of, of this difference, because you can get the difference, but I mean, you can get something that's different, but it may not be um, statistical significant. 
So we do see that uh, months and MJO phases for which this uh, new index, new predictor makes an impact are uh, actually statistical um, significant. And uh, we are looking here at the um, uh, correlation between the observed and the predicted uh, two meter uh, temperatures. And we do see, so uh, this area here inside the, the black line, it's the area where the, the correlation is statistical uh, significant. So during DJF, we do see uh, a strong uh, impact of, of this, um, this index on the, the forecast scale, not uh, so much for the, for the winter, uh, the summer, I'm sorry. So one more thing that we did, we look at the variance um, explained um, after we added this, uh, this predictor. And this is the variance explained by the forecasted temperature uh, without the 120-day uh, oscillation. And this is the variance explained after we added the 120-day uh, 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 oscillations. And this is for all ENSO phases and MJO phase 6. Uh, these are for all ENSO phases and uh, MJO phase 7. And this is um, October, November, December, a slightly different um, season. So there is a lot of improvement uh, by uh, adding this uh, in the prediction scale of week 3, 4 uh, after adding this, uh, this new uh, predictor. Well, it, it does show some MJO phase dependency. I mean, if you look here, right? So the vertical corresponds to the uh, um, MJO phases. So you do see some phases uh, that are where the impact is stronger, like four, five, one, four, five, eight, um, six, six in depending if you throw in El Nino or not. But if we don't, um, extremely what? What? Well, my whole conclusion was that it's actually independent of ENSO. So that was a very uh, encouraging result because right now uh, they make a very they make very good predictions when you have a strong ENSO signal. If you don't have ENSO, then their prediction skill goes way down. So uh, when we looked at the uh, neutral phases of uh, ENSO, we do see um, compar comparable impact with ENSO phases uh, with uh, you, uh, the presence of, uh, of ENSO, right? So um, that was um, something that um, for people doing uh, prediction was a very encouraging result. So to some, uh, okay, I knew the last one was So to summarize these um, results, uh, we can um, say that the um, mid-latitude uh, also is uh, characterized by some uh, subseasonal to seasonal variability. Um, the 120-day oscillation uh, predictor uh, demonstrated a forecast of uh, opportunity during the winter. Uh, and this 120-day uh, predictor increases the variance in the correlation by about uh, 25%. Um, unfortunately, the results are only for the United States because this model is the operational model that uh, 
NOAA is using for the uh, week three, four uh, outlook. But if you have similar models for other regions, I will be happy to um, see if it has uh, any impact on, on other regions because um, it looks like these oscillations have uh, a global structure, not only over the, like NAO has only, um, the, the main centers are located only over the uh, Euro uh, Atlantic uh, sector. So, in particular, your oscillation here has had actually very strong signals over the North Atlantic European. Yes, yeah, it does have. Yeah, but it also has signals in, in other regions, so it will be worth exploring um, that. So, you cannot use the same model and retune it and apply to Europe or something like that? I think you can, yeah, but you need to know what's the. You know, it has to be calibrated, I think, for, for that particular region. So you actually have a model that you apply for uh, Pakistan. So that might be another uh, option. Okay, so I'm done. So I'm happy to answer other questions. <laughs>